I'm still interested in mythology, photography, riding to hounds, in fact, in everything. But at 19, my thoughts turned to flying and I decided to do it seriously. I was convinced that aviation was a profession with a future and determined to earn my living and make my career a paying proposition. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Pauline Gower is best remembered today as the intrepid commander of the women's section of the Air Transport Auxiliary during the Second World War. But there is much more to Gower than those fateful six years. Overcoming childhood illness, Gower would go on to an incredible aviation career, publish two volumes of poetry and capped it all with the foundation of the women's section of the ATA, ensuring her pilots received equal pay for equal work in the dangerous delivery of high-performance aircraft. Under her leadership, women flew every type of RAF aircraft, ensuring a steady supply of new and replacement aircraft to frontline and training units. Alison Hill is a poet and author of the new biography of Pauline Gower, which is a heartfelt look at this remarkable woman and the remarkable woman that she surrounded herself with. Our conversation is going to focus on Pauline's life before the ATA, but when I'm speaking with a poet, about a poet, I had to ask Alison to start with, what drew her to Pauline Gower? Was it the poet or the pilot? I think it was very much both. Um, and a little story of how I came across Pauline Gower. Um, of all places in Hampton Court Emporium, which is grand title for a very dusty, overflowing shop full of vintage clothes, assorted glassware, ornaments from every decade. And on one of my visits, a pristine copy of Spitfire Women by Giles Whittle in the very small section of secondhand books. And I thought, wow, I mean, my, my eye was drawn to the cover, first of all, the pilots on the front. And I didn't really know that women had flown Spitflies in the Second World War, let alone, as I found out, tiger moths, mosquitoes, hurricanes, wellingtons, and many more types. So I soon just, I bought the book, of course, you know, I wasn't gonna leave the shop without it. And I soon discovered a wealth of stories. You've, you've got to throw typhoons and typhoons, tempests tempest. into your list, because yeah. they're, 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 they're my favorites, yeah. yeah. Everything. <laughs> so I bought the book and I was really lucky and I sort of lucky enough to meet some of the women in the pages. So that was fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I, I just decided it was Giles Wickler's book is a really, really great um, overview of the story of the pilots, of the women of the time. And he's a journalist, so he writes in it in a very succinct way. But I just thought reading through, I thought there's so many stories here that need uh, perhaps another way of reaching people. And so I decided to write a poetry collection as you do sort of and try and put as many women mm. in their stories into this poetry collection as I could um so that resulted in Sisters and Spitfires and I was really pleased to find that some of the pilots as well as you know flying these amazing array of planes throughout the war actually wrote themselves as well at least at least three or four of them wrote poetry and Pauline was one of them so I thought this is this is this is a synergy here really um and I was lucky enough to um actually publish republish some of her poems in a book before this one called 50 Ways to Fly. So I feel like her work is, is reaching new audiences. I've read some of her poems in schools and next to Spitfires and Hurricanes. And I just feel like her words are sort of resonating down the decades and are reaching new audiences like that. So. Because before I read your book, I had no idea about the poetry. I just knew Pauline Gower, head of women's section 88. That that was that was a tale. And, and dying tragi tragically young, of course. Um, but delving into that, there's just so many facets to her, which we're going to have a, a little chat yeah. about. But that was really, really interesting that this this woman who's probably main um, legacy is, is that ATA element, that people don't see the artist beyond the leader, which tends to happen sometimes really with historical figures. It's a really good way of putting it. She's really creative in lots of ways. I think writing was just one of the forms, but she um, composed some of her poems while waiting to take people up for flights. So, you know. Hmm. <laughs> well, we're going to get to that bit because we have to start at the beginning because her life just the, all the way through is just utterly fascinating. But who were her people? Where, were, where was she from? She was born in um, Tunbridge Wells. She was born on 22nd of July, 1910 at Sandown Court in Tunbridge Wells in Kent. She was the second daughter of parents, Sir Robert and Lady Dorothy Gower. 
So clearly she was from a fairly wealthy middle-class background, but she was determined from the outset when she'd left school, she was determined to make her way, her, her living, her, sorry, a way of earning her own living through the thing she loved best, which was flying. Which was quite unusual then. She could have just sort of sat back on her wealth and uh, decided she wasn't really going to do that, but that's what she did. And she followed her ambitions and made that happen. So her father, Sir Robert Gow, was quite a character. He was equally ambitious in the field of politics and has some strong causes to his name. He was known as the Dogs MP for his concern for animal welfare and was chair of the RSPCA for many years. He was also keen that both his daughters had a good education, which was fairly unusual for the time. We'll come on to that a little later, but his wife, Dorothy Gower, um, she was a very loyal wife and she undertook lots of um, engagements alongside him. She opened dog shows and uh, other, other interesting um, engagements, um, but she seemed to enjoy this and um, they, they appear in lots of press photographs alongside each other. And later, some of that work um, would fall to Pauline. I've just sort of Googled Robert Gow because I did this the other day. It, it's quite funny that the majority, you know, it's father of Pauline and then a little bit about the animal activism and, and that's about it. But he he was a, a very sort of, we call him a crusading MP nowadays, wouldn't he? He very much would pin his mask to, to various causes on the way you mentioned animal welfare and things. The thing I found interesting as well was the the work that, you know, the ladies of the family had had to do. They They were very much front and centre in his activities as an MP. He was involving the whole family, wasn't he? He was. He was also a real collector of um, scrapbooks. He's, he bequeathed 50 mm. scrapbooks. Um, these are thick books to Tunbridge Wells Library. So an excellent source of information and research. Um, I visited them twice, and I think I went through most of them. And now they're proudly, they have some new, lovely new archive boxes that have been moved from library to library. Um, they're very much sort of pride of place in the library. But he collected everything in the press. Pauline, obviously, was a focal point. She was in the press a lot through all her um, aviation career. And, and then her, her writing as well appeared in the press. But he, cl he collated all these into scrapbooks. Um, and I, I detail some of that in the book, 50 of them. And his, um, his older mm -hmm. daughter, Dorothy, also called Dorothy, um, when she married, he kept the serviette from her wedding. And it was folded into the, into the book. So I took it out and read it. And then I carefully folded it back along the folds he'd, he'd used. Um, so he really, he had a sort of, he wanted to preserve history as well, I think. And his daughter was the same. She also kept scrapbooks. So there's a family tradition, I think, of, of keeping memories. It's the thing a proud dad yeah. would do, isn't it? Keeping, keeping all the bits and pieces for his daughter. Daughters. Um, so what sort of child was, was Pauline? So she's growing up in quite a, an interesting house with sort of four, forthright views, left, right and centre. So what, what, what sort of girl was she? I think she was a very forthright girl as well. Um, she went to Beechwood Sacred Heart Convent School in Tunbridge Wells, just up the road, but she was a boarder. I think that was probably the tradition, really, which I think she enjoyed. Um, she was there for a good um, seven, eight years. And many former pupils, I was lucky enough to, to read about what some of her uh, sort of fellow peers had written about, and they all, um, I think she was a bit on a bit of a pinnacle, really. Um, she was called a glittering figure by one, one former school friend. Um, and I just read a little bit about what one of them has said, actually. Um, successfully academically musical, very good at games. She was popular with the schoolmates and the nuns, not just because of her talents and amusing ways, but because she was even tempered. And this friend said, I can't reflect her being unfair or unkind to a junior. She could always be relied on to organise treasure hunts in the school grounds charades or surprise concerts and her singing Lancashire songs accompanying herself on the ukulele in ribbons flying as she danced around is still a jolly memory. <laughs> she also, uh, which I was really intrigued, um, she also climbed out of, climbed every tree in the grounds and climbed out of most of the dormitory windows. And I put that into a poem about Pauline. Um, I went to visit the school a couple of times and these dormitory windows, they're on, I think, the second floor. It's an old crumbling building. And I think most of the sort of um, window ledges were crumbling when I was there. So I imagine her sort of climbing along window ledges and climbing down and just reaching for the sky. But also there's a real sense of adventure up there, I think, in her. Oh, Definitely. yeah. She, the, the, all, all, those, all those stories that you, you have from her school days, she seems like she was irre, irrepressible. It's the, the word that just kept sort of popping to my head. She, she's always was trying to push things on. But 
it wasn't all happy times, was it? She she was she got terribly she ill. She very nearly died at the age of seventeen. Um, she had a very serious brush with death. She was in and out of school infirmary uh, with an ongoing and prolonged ear infection, which turned out to be uh, very severe and very nearly escalated to to death. She was overnight um, in the hospital and. The nuns and the girls were, were lighting candles and praying for her, and there was a very strong fear that she was not going to make it through the night. Um, but she did. And I think strength of character and strength of her will, um, I think by the second day she was up demanding chicken soup or at least eating chicken soup. So she'd come through something very serious and, and very nearly died. And I think it slightly altered her perception. I think she thought now she was going to do as much as she could. Um, that's sort of my feeling from what she then went on to do and I think she thought you know she'd she'd come through sort of a very serious night and operation and she'd made it and she was she was going to go for it so yeah so flying enters her life around about this time so po post stillness isn't it and what what do you think drew her to that was it this this desire of the the, the brush from death to just literally grab the most exciting thing that she could and, and that was I great. think it is um, I'm going to read a couple of bits that sort of say in her own words um why she chose flying she she could have chosen lots of different things as she said I'm still interested in mythology photography riding to hounds in fact in everything but at 19 my thoughts turned to flying and I decided to do it seriously I was convinced that aviation was a profession with a future and determined to earn my living and make my career a paying proposition so that was that determined streak in her, I think. Yeah, it's that line there, the paying proposition. It, it wasn't just joining the flying set, which about this time was yeah, the one of one of the in things, wasn't it? The the, the Brooklyn's crowd and, and all of them. But it was it was to make it her own career out of it. Um, Very much so. I mean, really, her parents probably expected her to do a London season, which she did. And she said in her own words that she was bored to tears. Um, she, I think she went to Paris briefly. She did the London season. Was probably expected to find a suitable husband and eventually settle down and provide some grandchildren. But she wanted to do more with that. She'd had that brush with death. And um, so she told her parents. And I imagine this. I think I wrote it in a poem. But I did read. I did um read it in one of her own sort of pieces of writing that she told them over the breakfast table she was going to learn to fly and I imagine her father or I think it was recounted that he just shook his newspaper and um, carried on reading and her mother might have quietly put her teaspoon down sort of waiting for the reaction and I think her, her father said well I'm not going to pay for you to break your neck um he wasn't going to support her and so she decided that she was going to, she was going to fly and she gave violin lessons I mentioned she's very good at music. So she said she'd give violin lessons to unsuspecting pupils and earn money for flying lessons that way, which she did. Um, so she paid, she paid for initial uh, flying lessons. So Stag Lane was the place to learn to fly. And that's that's where Pauline went. It's one of those places that if I could go back, I'd love to just sit and watch because the stories about Stag Lane as just this social world of an airfield are fantastic and, and you paint a really vivid picture of it as well what what, what happens when pauline is yeah you know, pounced upon enough unsuspecting students with her violin <laughs> to, to to actually get involved there well she um she knew that she wanted to learn to fly and she found um stag lane north london and it was like you say a very famous um place it launched many a career and many a, a plane um and of course she met two people that were one in particular that was really to change her life she met Dorothy Spicer and she met Amy Johnson. Both, the three of them were sort of reaching the highs of what they were going to do. Very young, at a very young age. Um, they were going to break records. They were going to achieve all these licenses between them. And Amy Johnson was going to go from sort of um, whole typist pool to, to flying to Australia solo. Um, we need a brilliant idea. <laughs> Everyone's career path. <laughs> um, so they, they met there and they became great friends. Um, there might have been some sort of idea that they weren't you know competitive but from everything I read they were very good friends and very supportive of each other and Pauline and Dorothy in particular they decided very early on in sort of early um way of you know good working relations they decided that one was going to concentrate on on being the pilot and Dorothy would you know hone her skills um, and a very natural talent as an engineer and so they they you know they they focused on their their talents they didn't overlap so they were just they weren't competing with each other and and together they set up um 
as I'll come on to later. Um, and they, they were a, a formidable team together. Yeah, Dorothy Spicer seems as remarkable a lady as, as Pauline at the same time, isn't it? it, it she's she's the mechanic who is always there, always pushing, getting all, all of her all of her chits as well, which must have, as 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 you can must must have made the the gentleman she was going through those courses with very raised an eyebrow, perhaps. Um, but what, what sort of flying were they getting up to? Because it it was. It was not uneventful, if one is to use a Not at all, word. no. Um, and their memoir, which they wrote together, um, goes into great detail about all the many near misses. I mean, I think it was a lot of chance and circumstance their career to start with, you know, winging a prayer, literally. Um, but Dorothy was very skilled, and Pauline trusted her that she would keep their plane flying. So every night and all their sort of the summers they spent together, the air circuses, you know, Dorothy would be hard at work checking the plane every night to make sure it was safe. Um, and Pauline would be filling in her log books and, and preparing for the day ahead. But they, they made such a good team, I think, because they were both, I think, ambitious without sort of sensing that were being ambitious. But they were they were really making strides. I mean, Dorothy broke down barriers, and made huge strides for them in, in the field of, you know, aeronautical engineering. And Pauline did the same, and she was a pioneering pilot. So together, I think they they were they did break break down barriers, and they were in the press, and there was a lot of profile, and and um, all eyes were upon them really at that time. What were the the circuses that they flew in? Because it's one of those things that you, you sort of hear about co Cobham's flying circus and things like that. And of course, Monty Python ripped off the name um, many many years later for a very different thing. But what were these circuses that Pauline and Dorothy got involved in? Well, I think this was the fun part of the research. You know, these are circuses that the golden era of aviation, the 1930s, you know, a time that will never come again because we've got far too many health and safety roles for it to happen for a start. And we've, you know, so many different advances in aviation and everything else. So that particular time, you know, not, not so far after the first flights and sort of some amazing stunts. And, you know, I read about people being, pretending to be human planes in their exhibitions and the sort of their... Um, um, sort of, you know, exploits in the sky, really. Um, so they joined Campbell Black's Air Circus. They spent a season with the Crimson Fleet and another season with the British Hospitals Pageant, which involved, you know, one summer or one two months out of the year, they might fly across England 200 towns to give displays. And these were long hours, long days. And as I said, that, you know, um, they would be looking after the plane at night. But I imagine they had huge amounts of fun doing this. You know, they were young. They were like daredevils in a way and they were just having fun and they were two women usually in a crowd of men um i've seen photos and photos in the book the barnstormers and there's a group of men really and there's pauline and dorothy looking like they're having as much fun as the whole group really um they never really there were never too many accounts of huge amounts of sexism i think obviously they were they were doing something different they were very much in a man's world but they were proving themselves in that man's world i think so i think they were just wasn't wasn't overtly um, any too too bad in that way. I was doing a bit of googling earlier, mm. and I realised I forgot one important question when I saw a picture of Pauline and Dorothy and their dog. Ah, yeah, because it was very much the third one in this group. Where did the dog come from? Very, very well spotted. Um, well, I think Pauline had the same love of animals as her father. And she, this always, always seems to be a little dog in the photographs that I, when I was looking. Um, so Wendy was the dog that um, she had for a few years and she flew 5,000 miles with him, if you can imagine that. And I think um, she's a little um, Yorkshire Terrier, I think, and her hair must have been quite blown by, you know, the open cockpits. But, you know, she was, she was in lots of um, fair amounts of flights. So yes, and I think she flew, um, flew around the country with them. Wendy's a good name. So the, besides the, the circuses, they're, they're honing a very early sort of form of air taxi business. And um, how did they get on? Because it's very unusual to, for it to be a, a woman-led company, let alone a woman-led early airline. Completely. I mean, they were unique. This was another first in their lives between them. They set up um, Air, air Trips Limited um, mm -hmm. and they had advertising and, and sort of they just decided they were going to set up in a field. Um, that was the first, one of the first summers. And I think they had a sign saying flights turn left here. You know, it was, it was very basic. 
And they sat in this field and waited and eventually word got around that you could go up for a few shillings or oh, the actual price. And, you know, these women will take you up. Um, and then a couple of summers were in, North, in Norfolk, in Hunstanton. Probably their happiest summers, I think. They called it Happy Hunstanton. And um, I was going to come to this point at the end of our chat, but um, I was lucky enough last year to meet somebody who'd been up with them. Oh, wow. So he's in his mid-90s, um, and they inspired him to join the RAF and become a pilot. So as soon as this is all connections through the RAF news, they'd done a preview of the mm. book, and he'd, he'd, you know, it sparked memories. And so I was, you know, I thought I'm not going to meet many people that have met Pauline and Dorothy. So I went to visit him in Norfolk. It was a lovely afternoon with all his memories and bits of Spitfire all around his house <laughs> and lots of memorabilia. And I think, you know, he enjoyed our afternoon in the meeting. I gave him signed copies of the book. But, oh, he said, yes, these two young girls just, just turn up in the field. And we, we knew they were coming and we used to run up to the fields and be taken up with them. And yeah, they just took up 33,000 passengers over those summers. Um, usually sometimes just for a short hop, you know, five minutes up in the air. Again, this is all of the time, isn't it? That wouldn't, wouldn't happen now. There'd be far too much charting of the airways. But yeah, they did that. We must remember that it's, it's an entirely different environment. You know, for, for us, it's holiday, isn't it? You go to the airport, you get squidged onto a, an aluminium tube and... Yeah. <laughs> People try to make as much money out of you as possible, and that's it. But to to go up in an aeroplane in the 1930s was just the most remarkable opportunity for for anyone. And it, it's you know you, you said that the, the chap that you spoke to was said these these ladies showed up and, and and off they went. And it's it's a familiar story for people with their first flights. It was usually a chance encounter where somebody was able to seize an opportunity or blag their way into into the, the good graces of the pilot. Indeed, and there are lots of them. Um, I put lots of details of those flights in the book. One particular one was that Pauline found lots of, um, she'd taken up clearly uh, someone, a Catholic, um, because they'd left lots of little relics around the, um, the plane afterwards and a, and a rosary, um, probably because they were hoped they'd get down in one piece. So they'd left off these. <laughs> and she just thought that was really funny having to collect all this at the end of a flight. So she was, I mean, I think she used her writer's eye to put all that detail into her book. And I think that it, she just thought that was hugely sense of fun in there as well. But she was giving these people experiences, but she was getting some interesting human interactions along the way. We're going to talk about her writing in a second, but I suppose we have to ask the question, what did her father make of all of this as, you know, a, a, a stern, like sort of the Edwardian age, you know, his daughter running an airline, gallivanting off around the country. What did the MP think of his daughter's actions? Well, I think um, it, it showed in Pauline's character that she was very good at diplomacy and, and slowly and quietly getting her own way because that's what she did. Um, and also you <laughs> mentioned earlier him being proud is what you do for daughters. You know, he, he was proud of her. So obviously he put up a front to start with and, um, you know, wasn't going to help her. But then by her 21st birthday, he bought her a plane, her second hand Spartan. I think his reasoning was probably that, you know, he'd, he'd rather she was doing it safely um, with sort of a decent plane. I think he knew that probably that she was probably had the strength of character that he did and went for a cause. And I think he knew that she was she was going to become a pilot, or whatever. Um, so he might as well support her. And then it wasn't so long, I think, before he was really proud of her and all the cuttings in his scrapbook showed that pride. For sure. As, as the father of the daughter, I still have boxes of artwork and school reports and exactly. pictures and things. You, you keep, you keep, these you keep everything, yeah. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Director of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Douglas A-20G Havoc. The A-20 Havoc was an attack aircraft light bomber of World War II. Originally built and designed with a glass nose with a bombardier, in the Pacific Theater, like B-25s, Pappy Gunn came up with this idea of manning these aircraft with solid noses and a bunch of machine guns for doing strafing attacks on Japanese airfields and attacking Japanese shipping. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew with the 89th Bomb Squadron in New Guinea uh, on a mission. 
uh, I think, bombing WEWAC. It was damaged and made an emergency landing in a swamp in New Guinea. The crew was recovered, and the aircraft sat there pretty much forever until it was found in the 80s, and in the early 90s, it was recovered by the Royal Australian Air Force. This A-20 with another one that they had, they restored the one Helen Pelican, which was another combat veteran from the Pacific. They use a lot of the parts from this aircraft for that aircraft. Then it actually went to a civilian owner, and then we ended up buying from that civilian owner and finished up the restoration, put it on display here. It's a unique aircraft in the fact there's only about four, if I recall, A-20 Havocs anywhere on display in the world, with one in a private collection, one at the Air Force Museum, one here, and one in a private collection in Russia. But uh, I'd say it's always been one of my favorite aircraft, I think just because of the lack of them as survivors and also just seeing a lot of those cool photos from World War II where you see these A-20s coming in low over a ball, bombing Japanese cruisers and, and transports. And, you know, they're like literally flying right like at mass height over these ships. Um, so I just always found it to be a pretty cool airplane. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. Like we were saying before, it, it was the Pauline as a sort of artist, as, as writer, which I, I knew nothing about and was enthralled to, to hear about, you know, piffling poems for pilots and, and, and her book and things. What were the reactions to the collections? Because you, you sort of include a few... In, in your book, along with your own poetry, that's, I, I, I sort of love that you sort of have that connection there. But what was the reaction when this daughter of an MP who was gallivanting around the country in an airplane published a collection of poems? I think it was a fairly amused reaction, possibly, but mostly they were very well received. Um, she'd made her name as for herself already. And then to have this added interest that she was writing poems and you know, it was detailed that she was writing them while waiting to take up passengers. And, and once she wrote an overly long poem and Dorothy, who probably wasn't so much into poetry, said, I really quite like it. If you stop that poem now, I think, you know, if it ends at line six, that would be that would be great. Um, so, you know, there's a little backstory that where she was composing her poems. Um, I tried to, to follow her suit, actually, and try and write. Uh, write a poem while I was being taken up in a small plane. And as soon as I realized that, you know, I was going to be airsick and couldn't even write anything, I decided. <laughs> but, you know, I admire her for, for doing that in between all that sort of frantic sort of flying life that she had. So, so yes, um, they were, were, were received. And Amy Johnson said very good things about it. She offered a review of her envied friend's acknowledged achievements, saying that although she, the exhilaration of flying often made her want to break into song, she didn't have Pauline's talent with the written word. And she reminded readers of the Tunbridge Wells advertiser that her friend enjoyed a successful strategic partnership. Pauline flies and composes poems while Dorothy looks after the engine in the machine. I think she's putting that very succinctly of how that partnership works. Looking back at it over the, the course of 80 years and with a poet's eye, and there's someone with a tin ear for these sorts of things, do they do they hold up? I I don't know if that's the right question to ask, but yeah, for 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 someone who's who looks at these things probably a little bit more critically than say I I would, and just think oh that that's lovely and turn the page, the sort of way she would compose and and, and phrase. What's what's your poet's sensibilities say about them? So it's a really interesting question, and and when I knew that she wrote poetry, when I managed to get hold of piffling poems for pilots, um, I was a little bit wary. I thought. Oh, what am I going to think of them? You know, because like you say, there's this 80 year gap and poetry is, is so much different now and how we perceive it, how we write it, how we, you know, read it aloud. Um, so I think they stand the test of time. They're very much of their time, the way they're written. Um, some people might say that they're almost light verse. And I don't think Pauline herself took them extremely seriously. I think she thought she was writing to entertain, really. Um, so they're very accessible. And they have that, that important sense of humour that I think marks her, her life and her career. So they're full of humour. And I've also dis um, discovered there's a depth to them. There's a flickering subtlety of light and shade, but mostly there's humour. Yes, it, it 
the the, the few you have in the, the book, I, I I don't know. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Did yeah. did you have a favourite you wanted to to share or? Well, I mean, there's one I'm, there's one I did put in in, in the chapter about her, her poems, um, so I could yeah. share that one. And that would be that would be that would be lovely. Like, like I said, yeah, yeah. It, it might be might be wasted on me, but I'm sure our list our listener is, is far more discerning person than, than I am when it comes well, I to I think this, this really shows her sense of humour. Mm. So it's called The Stranger Pilot. From some far continent he came to teach us how to fly. We'd not even heard his name from whence he came or why. He told us of all the things he'd done at least a hundred times and all about the cups he'd won in distant foreign climes. From tales he told we had to grant he was no also ran. With wonder we exclaimed, you can't. But he replied, I can. It was a joy to tease and bait that pilot of renown, and each in turn would lie in wait and try to do him down. One day we caught him by the sea, that was the last of him. Demortuous, well, R.I.P., the blighter couldn't swim. <laughs> she, yeah, she, she's clearly having a lot of fun she is. With, with her and observations. I think, I think she, she, it, yeah. was, it was that. It was a sense of fun and a little bit of getting at the, the pilot. Obviously, Phil, he was a, a wizard pilot, to use a, another term mm. from the, the time. <laughs> you clearly spent a lot of time with, with her work and things happened. How did it inspire you in your in your own works when when you were writing about about the women and 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 what sort of moved you after spending a lot of time with Pauline's poetry? I think possibly that um, she didn't go on to write more. Really, mm. there were sort of poems of a young woman. Um, as I said, they were amusing, their light. But and I've only really just thought this, but she might have. Um, gone on to write some deeper poems you might have gone on to write all sorts of things but um i think they're of their time but they're of her time as well mm. yeah and it was also just just to add it was a it was a, quite mm. an honor to republish them and to have the permission of her son to, to put them in this book as well because i think it's just giving them that extra lease of life really very much so and it, it it's remembering just how young she was through throughout all the all the things that she she crammed in but um the the other the other thing you you mentioned earlier was her sort of memoir of her and dorothy's adventures women with wings um how did that book differ from the poetry because that's very much more sort of nuts and bolts what we're getting up to sort of thing it really is what, yeah and yeah. i was delighted it's a very rare book now i was really delighted to get my hands on a copy because until i read that book i really didn't have pauline's voice I don't think. Um, I tried to find a copy online and I was very pleased when a, a friend, a, a researcher who's now become a friend, lent me a copy and she bubble wrapped it beautifully. I was thinking this this book is, I think it might have been between lockdowns and it was coming at Christmas time with the post. I remember the post had all stacked up. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I opened my door and it was on the doorstep. And, you know, when I unwrapped this bubble wrap and this time, and this sort of history, um, her voice really shines through. So it was a memoir of their time um, flying together, their six summers. And it's the only time that Pauline and Dorothy actually nearly fell out because they couldn't decide who was going to write the main part of the book and who was going to top it, tail it with a forward and afterward. And I'm going to ask you now, Matt, who do you think won? I'm guessing it was Pauline. Yeah, she did. Mm. She decided that, yes, the determination won that one. But they didn't fall out for long because Pauline did, um, Pauline did get to write the main part. And, Dor and um, Dorothy Spicer did sort of write the, the introduction and, and the afterword. But she writes with lots of energy. She's very humorous. And it's so it details their, their time together, their, their scrapes and their, um, their adventures. But it also includes some of her writings from journals. She wrote for the Women's Engineering Society and lots of other aviation or, um, journals. And she was, um, she was encouraging, really, women to fly and young girls to consider careers in, in the aviation, bearing in mind it was still in the early times of women actually getting into aviation. So she was a huge advocate for women in that way. And so the book's informative, but it's also very entertaining. And I just, if I could just read a short passage, she, she almost mm. looked ahead to her, her own place in aviation history. And this sort of rather poignant, but very appalling um, paragraph. In 20 or 30 years time, I can picture myself being looked upon in very much the same light as one now regards the retired captain of a windjammer 
I should be invited to aeronautical dinners as a sort of curiosity. Young pilots employed in making rocket-like ascents from Hyde Park with some up-to-date contraption, which can tr transport a hundred businessmen to Paris in half an hour, will listen and laugh as I make my la little speech about the good old days at Stag Lane and Croydon. Uh, to be able to get to Paris in a half an hour. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, 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 that's very moving. And I, because she didn't get that opportunity. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it would have, it would have been amazing. It would have been amazing to, to, to have seen her hold court as she undoubtedly would have had, had she had that opportunity. The thing that really surprised me about this book, uh, you, you mentioned that Amy, Amy Johnson wrote, wrote the forward and, and uh, you, you cover in the book that lots of people have tried to make it out as a rivalry, but it was, it was a friendship, which is clearly from the forward. But the, um, how should we put this? Prickly editor of Aeroplane. Oh, yes. C.G. Gray actually wrote a good review. I, I, I believe this is the only time I've ever heard of Gray writing a positive review of something. He did. I mean, I put some of his less um, favorable comments in the book as well, which readers can discover. <laughs> but he did. He wrote that Pauline's keen sense of humor cuts across all her 18 bursts of facile rhyme. The meter runs as almost as evenly as an aero engine, and the author, the authoress, is to be recommended for avoiding the highbrow. He, he goes on to say that the booklet was dedicated to a friend and partner, Miss Dorothy Spicer, which will appeal to all who knew this irrepressible pair of sportsmen. An interesting slant, and one that would probably have caused Pauline to arch at least one eyebrow. Mm. But he said good things, so that was all good. He's he's a fascinating and terrible character all in the same go. But that that is lovely that that he was able to recognise that as 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 well. Well, as as the world starts getting a little bit darker in in the thirties, how how are how are Pauline and Dorothy going? Does does the air trips business manage to to keep going all the way up till nineteen thirty nine? No, they finished um, sooner than that. They both had a the actual date to hand but they finished a um, couple of sadnesses in both their lives and they decided that um, it was time to wind it up um, mm -hmm. they'd had their day and I think the last but one season had been really taking its toll on Pauline's health and just generally the sort of you know it was, they were tiring tiring seasons mm -hmm. and summers and um, not particularly um, didn't make an awful lot of money so um, I think they decided that the, you know the six years had been long enough and um, it was time to to do something else and of course then war was looming uh, yeah. yeah we're not going to delve into the formation of the ata and, and and too much because we want people to to, to read the book but i think i think the, the question to ask really was she she was very aware of the political situation i guess being the daughter of an mp you you, you keep a finger on the pulse don't you um how did she just use her connections to ensure that the door would eventually open for, for the women's section? Cause she, she networked like a pro, didn't she? She did. Yes. And she did it in her own style, which, um, as someone has said, is stealthily or sort of, um, step by step. And she knew where she was mm -hmm. going. She knew that the end result was that she knew there was a pool of, you know, talented women pilots that could be needed and could be used. The ATA was sort of, in early ideas and it was obviously going to be they hadn't really considered using female pilots it was going to be men but Pauline knew that you know th these women could be utilized and could really help um and so once you know discussion started and she did use the sort of networking that she'd, she'd you know the connections she'd made um so she sort of almost one meeting at a time just pushing slowly slowly but she got where she wanted and she used that skill of diplomacy and um, sort of leadership in her role um throughout the sort of time as she was leading because then she you know she won equal pay for her women which after all the many firsts is something that perhaps people do not know about her and it was the first in employment history you know that women um achieved equal pay for doing the same job which is something the wasps over in the states never got was it i think i don't think so having no. just yeah, yeah uh, that's it's yeah. that is it's a re remarkable thing because 
the danger levels exactly the same exactly. in that role so there can't really be too too much too much argument about it well just turn to legacy now and what what do you think Pauline's legacy is today you know like we were saying b- before that the ATA shone bright as this incredible moment but having spent so much time with her what do you feel her legacy is or should be I think she deserves to be much better well known which was one of the reasons for wanting to write this new biography um she was a clear leader of her time lots of the women who I interviewed or read um sort of their their own recollections for her so she was a natural leader and they all sort of recount this with warmth and they really remember her as a as a good solid leader but who was kind and compassionate as well and empathy which all those sort of leadership qualities so i think that was a legacy i think the fact that she led those women successfully through the war um one in 10 of all ata pilots died one in 10 yes it was um and so she had to deal with all those sort of situations as well and just keep on leading um so i think her resilience and her sort of all those qualities she showed was it was a huge legacy, but the fact that, you know, she enabled those women to fly in all the planes and have the, all the experiences, which in turn then enabled them to, some of them at least, to be able to fly after the war, which in turn led some of those ATA women pilots to set up um, the British Women Pilots Association 10 years after the war. So you can see her legacy feeding down the decades and the fact that, you know, some of the ATA women set up this association, which is still going strong and which I really wanted to bring this book up to date with and share some interviews and some low highlights and just to show her legacy in that way. So. I'm a fan. It is a wonderful, wonderful book and the humanity that you capture there is, as, as well is, 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 is wonderful. And I guess legacy wise, what a change that around to a more personal question. What does she mean to you now? Well, I had her portrait. She, her and Dorothy um, sat for portraits or photographs, actually, and they were in the National um, Portrait Gallery. And so I, I bought those at the start of the, the process. And um, she was sort of above my desk as I wrote. And I, there's this clear gaze of hers. And so I think what she means is as a woman of her time of, who made her time very much important to herself but also a much bigger picture and her role and her war effort and her sort of what she did for other women really I think and I think that's her legacy and I think that's the connection I felt with her when I was writing about her and and the fact that tragically her life was cut short you know after giving birth to twins and you know that's when I read that and when I discovered that I thought wow that's um, sadness it's a huge sadness but if we can bring her more into the public mind and, and memory I think that's important too and I think you've done that very well. I, I do. I do have one one extra thing I would say. What is your favourite Pauline Gower moment that people should hunt hunt for in the book? Now, that's a question I wasn't expecting. No, I see. I don't, <laughs> always always throw one in to catch out my guests. <laughs> favourite, favourite. I think people should look for um, a story about a swamp. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. And also, um, it's a little tie in there because in the RAF Museum, where they have a wonderful archive, um, which I was only able to access almost towards the end of the writing process because I was writing in lockdown and these places were closed. So I went and had a lovely day in the archive and found some of her own writing. And um, she wrote a short story about the swamp episode, Death in the Swamp. So if people could read that as well alongside, I think that would just be a brilliant sort of um, pulling down moment. But there were many. Fantastic. Alison, this has been a delight. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. So thank you so much for spending the time with us and uh, writing the book. Because I, like I said, I devoured it. It was just a wonderful, wonderful read. Well, thank you very much for letting share her story. And hopefully people will be able to find out more about Pauline as well. So thank you. Thank you. I cannot thank Alison Hill enough for joining us here on The Damcasters. I found her book really quite touching and moving as there are so many aspects of Pauline's life I had no clue about. Her life working with Dorothy Spicer before the war was something that shone a light on an era of British flying that I find utterly fascinating. 
in that you could just go find some random people in a field with an airplane and go for a flight. How cool would that have been? But Pauline's book, which is out now from the History Press, is called Pauline Gower, Pioneering Leader of the Spitfire Women. And as I said, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I can highly recommend it. It is a fascinating read and Alison has done a wonderful job with the biography. I just have to thank the History Press for sending me a review copy and putting me in touch with Alison as well. It's very kind of them. As always, there'll be a link to the book from our bookshop in the description below. As usual, a little bit goes to support the podcast. And of course, the best way you can support the podcast is by liking, subscribing, doing all those sorts of things. But just give us a quick review. Whatever your podcast app of choice is, stick some stars in it, leave some notes, let me know how we're getting on, if there's anything you'd like to see. And it really does help nudging the algorithms into helping people find the podcast. Of course, you can always tell your friends because, you know, that's the easy way to get people to listen. Just tell them how great this is, despite the guy that hosts it. The guests are fantastic. And we have more fantastic guests coming up. I'd just like to take this moment as well to thank our sponsor and partner, the Pima Air and Space Museum. We're going to be having another fantastic interview with one of the people from Arizona at the beginning of May. So keep your ears peeled for that one. Of course, there's the Patreon as well, three pounds a month. We're going to call it the Damn Casteers going on forward, mainly because I'm really excited about the upcoming Musketeers movie and being a Dumas nut. Why not? So if you want to join and become a Damn Casteer, check out the links in the description below. There's going to be more bits and pieces on there. We've got a new video up where I delve into my love-hate relationship with the first of the few. That's for the Patreon fans for the time being. And I think it was a lot of fun to do. Next time, we'll have another guest. And as always, we'll be back soon next week with another episode. And I do hope you'll join us. Until then, thank you, everybody, for your continued support of the pod. This is great fun. I know it's been a couple of weeks since the last episode. Bit of the black dog. But thanks for understanding and tuning in again. So... Until next time, thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.